The fragile peace on the line of contact between Karabakh and the Azerbaijani armed forces collapsed on the night of April 2, 2016. At the very beginning, it was not completely clear what this was. Another common act of provocation or a new war? A short while later, all doubts vanished when large-scale military operations began with the use of heavy artillery, armored vehicles, and aviation. The authorities of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic registered a total attack by their adversary, which hit the Martakert, Martuni, and Hadrut regions in the northeastern and southern parts of Nagorno-Karabakh. The authorities of Artsakh and Armenia immediately informed the international community about the unprecedented aggression by Azerbaijan and called on the OSCE Minsk Group, the mediator in the settlement of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, for an immediate and targeted reaction to the situation, announcing that this was in fact a violation of the ceasefire that had lasted nearly 22 years. A trilateral ceasefire agreement was signed on 12 May 1994 by the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, Armenia and Azerbaijan in the course of the Karabakh War of 1992-1994. The main provision of the agreement was to ensure a complete cessation of fire and military operations from one minute past midnight on May 12, 1994. From 1992 to the present day, negotiations are ongoing for the peaceful settlement of the conflict within the framework of the OSCE Minsk Group, co-chaired by the United States, Russia, and France. International institutions, humanitarian organizations, and the Troika of the OSCE Minsk Group co-chairs condemned the use of force in the conflict zone, calling on the parties to cease fire and make efforts to stabilize the situation. At the same time, the authorities of Turkey expressed support to official Baku. Intensive battles continued along practically the entire front line. The Azerbaijani army attacked using long-range firepower, multiple rocket launchers, powerful flamethrowers, tanks, helicopters, and assault drones. The armed forces of Nagorno-Karabakh resorted to active defense. They tried to surround Nagorno-Karabakh with claws like this, and the times and places of these strikes were not simply coincidental or random choices. They intended to resolve the Karabakh issue by April 24, that is, to seize and defeat the Karabakh army and annihilate the people of Artsakh by the 101st anniversary of the Armenian genocide. They wanted to raise their flag in the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh by April 24. But things ended in a fiasco. Their plan of a blitzkrieg simply broke down. The Azerbaijani army did not manage to move forward by even a kilometer. Moreover, this happened despite the several billions allocated to their military budget, their purchase of modern weapons, as well as the recruitment of mercenaries from all over the world especially from terrorist organizations like the Islamic State and the Grey Wolves. From day one of the escalation of the conflict, the official sources of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic and representatives of more than 50 international mass media outlets registered multiple incidents of targeted firing from the Azerbaijani side towards civilian locations in Nagorno-Karabakh. On April 2, a 12-year-old died in the schoolyard of Zoravan village in the Martuni region as a result of artillery fire, while his younger brother and friend were wounded.
As the defender of human rights of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, I blame the authorities of Azerbaijan because this is a war crime with all its attributes. Azerbaijan has allowed the grossest of violations, directing weapons at peaceful inhabitants and civilian facilities. The attack was organized at 2 a.m. when people were asleep. And there was absolutely no need to fire at the towns of Martuni and Martakert or the villages of Talish and Maraga, because those were areas with no military presence. The military posts were on the front line. They directed all their might against a peaceful population. Look at the kind of destruction that has resulted. The village of Talish is practically non-existent. You can see the destruction of town and village infrastructures in all the regions hit by the Azerbaijani military attack. The villages of Talish and Mataris, as well as the town of Martakert, are literally a few kilometers from the line of contact. And that is why they suffered the most. Grandfather Gurgen shows what now remains of his house. The only reason he wasn't hurt himself was because he was out of the house early in the morning to run some errands. A short while later, the city was under artillery fire. When he came back, he saw these ruins where his house once stood. The walls of the house and the garden gate have been chopped up by splinters and resemble a sieve while the yard looks like an earthquake has struck. This tree was planted by my father's father in the last century. We have baked bread in its shade and hosted guests. These are our roots, our family comes from here. And I have built this house with my own hands. The enemy destroyed it, but I will build it again. And I will live here till the end of my life. I was born here and I will die here. Karabakh has always been the Armenian's land, and we will not move an inch from here. We have had three weddings for my children in this house. I already have seven grandchildren, and we will celebrate their weddings here too. No matter what the enemy dreams up, no matter what they do, they cannot drive us away from our homes, from our land. They cannot break our spirit. I am 76 years old and I am ready to pick up a gun and fight together with our brave young soldiers. We are all ready to die for our motherland. In 1921, the Soviet authorities forcibly included a historically Armenian land, Nagorno-Karabakh, with a population that was 95% Armenian, in the Azerbaijan SSR. In the years that followed, the Armenians tried to restore historical justice, but the issue remained unresolved. A new phase in the Karabakh conflict arose in 1988, after the announcement by the mainly Armenian-populated Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast of its exit from the Azerbaijan SSR. In response to this, the Azerbaijanis organized mass programs of Armenians in Sumgait, Baku and Kirovabad. On September 2, 1991, the Council of People's Deputies adopted a declaration proclaiming the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic within the borders of NKAO and the bordering Shahumyan region of the Azerbaijan SSR. On December 10, a referendum was held on the status of the NKR, and 99% of voters voiced their desire for independence. Following this, Azerbaijan initiated a war which lasted until May 1994, and resulted in the loss of their control not only of Nagorno-Karabakh, but also of seven adjacent regions. More than 50,000 people died as a result of the war. On April 3, Azerbaijan declared a unilateral ceasefire. However, they did not move beyond words, so the intensive firing on Nagorno-Karabakh and raids of sabotage groups continued. Yeah, 
Karen! This footage by the media company Civilnet TV from their film crew working in Martaget that day is clear evidence that Azerbaijan's official announcement was a deliberate falsehood. The journalists were among the first ones caught in Azerbaijani artillery fire. We reached the town administration where we were told that Azerbaijan had declared a unilateral cessation of military operations. We had started to work calmly, but the shooting began a short while later. Based on the sounds, we counted about 30 rounds of artillery fire. We have also been in the villages of Talish and Mataris, and what we have seen suggests that the Azerbaijani armed forces had intentionally shot at every house. This rifle is always with me. I used to go hunting, but times have changed. Rafael Petrosian is a meritorious educator of Martaket, whom they still call Comrade Petrosian, as in the old days. He was a physics teacher for various schools of the town for 30 years. He worked as the head of education programs and then as the school principal. He is retired now, but hasn't lost his ties with the educational institutions, and he often visits the school children. During the days of war in April, when the shooting stopped, the first thing he did was to go around to the schools dear to his heart. The school, the church, these are sacred places where people would once seek asylum and find safety. Those who shoot at them are not human beings, they are terrorists. In the 1990s, during the Karabakh War, I was an artilleryman. But we never even thought of shooting civilians. When we liberated populated areas, we always informed the adversary before the assault that we were opening a corridor for the evacuation of their civilians. But the Azerbaijanis are not familiar with humanity of this kind. And the events these days have once again convinced us of this. As the famous poet Avedi Kisakyan said, when Christ said, love thine enemy, Turks were not around then. He considered them inhumane. The NKR Defense Army managed to defeat the attack during a short period of time, and it was not only on the northeastern direction of Martaget region, but along the whole perimeter of the line of contact. A counterattack followed, and as a result, the people of Karabakh regained control of a number of strategically important positions and support points. On April 5, the sides reached an agreement to cease military operations. The next step was the activation of efforts by the OSC Minsk Group. The mediators visited the participant countries in the conflict and held negotiations with their leaders. From the very beginning, Azerbaijan presents a distorted picture of the conflict, accompanied with hysteria and focused on territories. Their stated reasons for the confrontation do not coincide with our perception of the conflict. We are not fighting for territories, but for our motherland and dignity. During all these years, we reached many agreements on not violating the ceasefire regime. But Azerbaijan violated all these agreements, and every time it resulted in new casualties. Taking into consideration the fact that we are dealing with an adversary of this kind, I call on everybody to be constantly alert. And in case of a recurrence of this aggression, we will strike back. And together, Artsakh, Mother Armenia and the Armenian diaspora, we are united. The response to the threat against Artsakh's security once again visibly demonstrated the solidarity of the Armenian people. From the very beginning of the escalation of the conflict, thousands of civilians and Karabakh war veterans from all the regions of Armenia enrolled themselves in voluntary cohorts. Regular people donated blood, sent clothes, food, medicine, and transferred money to Artsakh. Support came from the diaspora as well. This national solidarity at a moment of difficulty confirmed that the spirit of the Armenians' unity is immortal. <laughs> Hello, Hogan Carl,
Over the course of four days of armed operations unleashed by Azerbaijan, the NKR Defense Army fulfilled all its military objectives and prevented the adversary's aggression. The losses of the Azerbaijani army included more than 2,000 dead and more than 3,000 wounded, 24 enemy tanks, 4 mechanized infantry vehicles, 2 helicopters, 14 drones, 1 Grad multiple rocket launcher, and 1 Sonsapyok flamethrower were destroyed. The Armenian side lost dozens of heroes, and hundreds of them were wounded. The losses of military machinery consist of 14 tanks. During the course of this large-scale aggression, Azerbaijan openly showed that it was not going to observe the commonly acknowledged rules of military engagement prescribed in the Geneva Conventions. The most basic principle of this convention is that, irrespective of military operations, peaceful inhabitants and civilian facilities should not be turned into military targets. However, the enemy committed unimaginable atrocities and violated a whole range of conventions on international humanitarian law. There is a large body of evidence. The first cases of extreme brutality were demonstrated in the village of Talish, where enemy saboteurs first killed three elderly civilians and then cut their ears. It happened in this house. Here are the photos of the innocent victims. Another horrendous case involved a serviceman of the NKR Defense Army. A conscripted soldier who was killed during the fighting was later beheaded. The Azerbaijani military displayed the 20-year-old young man's head in their villages, military units and positions, photographed and videotaped this and posted it on the internet. The aim of this barbarous action was to raise the spirits of its army and scare the adversary. And these shots of similar atrocities, also including cases where photos and videos were taken, were by ISIS terrorists active on the territory of Iraq and Syria. The similarity in the style of these monstrous atrocities, executions and torture, accompanied by infinite cruelty, can be seen even with the naked eye. In both cases, the main targets of the armed villains were defenseless people, whether they were civilians escaping war or wounded servicemen. This tactic of mimicry and the similarity of their actions undoubtedly equates ISIS with the armed forces of Azerbaijan. When our soldiers were fighting and defending the attacks of the Azerbaijani army, they could distinctly hear Arabic and Turkish speech. They saw people not wearing the Azerbaijani military uniform, and they were not conscripts, they were hardened fighters and killers, and their clothing and uniform exactly matched that worn by the ISIS fighters. The truth is that thousands of fighters from Azerbaijan took part in the formation of ISIS groups during the wars in Iraq and Syria. A sufficiently large number of those fighters were regular officers of the Azerbaijani army. That is why they have the experience and they have already mastered the technique of the ISIS fighters and other terrorist organizations. And they were the ones who have brought fighters of non-Azerbaijani origin back with them to the Azerbaijani regions. And the latter, by the way, have also plundered the population of Azerbaijan. And the Azerbaijani people should understand that a regime that hires killers and thieves can't be a guarantor of security for common folk. During four days of fierce fighting, the Azerbaijani units were not simply using excessive force against civilians. They had specifically been tasked with systematically annihilating the civilian population. 
Вы помните случай Сафарова, азербайджанского военнослужащего Сафарова, который... You remember the case of the Azerbaijani serviceman Safarov, who axed his sleeping Armenian colleague only because of the latter's Armenian nationality. And remember that instead of condemning him, the Azerbaijani government, on the contrary, promoted him, gave him an apartment, and made him a hero. And oddly enough, my colleague, the Azerbaijan defender of human rights, was involved in this, instead of denouncing that man. Events are now developing so quickly that they have changed their behavioral model. This is a terrorist state. I would not say that this is an imitation of the ISIS style. This is ISIS itself, because only they can behead a man, no matter who he is, a civilian or a soldier, and then show the head to the whole world. This is indeed ISIS. Конечно же, это ИГИЛ. The NKR Human Rights Defender has already addressed the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights, and has sent letters to the European Ombudsman Institute and to a number of international organizations engaged in humanitarian issues. Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia are also putting together the evidence base of the military crimes committed by the Azerbaijani military in order to turn to the International Military Tribunal in the nearest future. The Armenian side intends to institute criminal proceedings against the guilty. On April 10, 18 servicemen of the NKR Defense Army who were subjected to torture and debasement were handed to the NKR State Commission on Prisoners of War, Hostages and Missing Persons through the mediation of the International Committee of the Red Cross and the personal representative of the OSCE chairperson in office. This outrageous act of inhumanity grossly violates the norms of international humanitarian law. In particular, they violate the requirements of the First Geneva Convention of 1949 on the amelioration of the condition of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field, the Third Geneva Convention of 1949 relevant to the treatment of prisoners of war, and also Additional Protocol 1 of 1977 to the Geneva Conventions relating to the protection of victims of international armed conflicts. During the course of military operations, there were also a number of crimes, moreover with genocidal features, that the Azerbaijani authorities committed, oddly enough, against the citizens of their own country. Azerbaijan is a multi-ethnic state, and the Talish, Lesgins, and Avars comprise the bulk of ethnic minorities. They are permanently subjected to persecution by the authorities, who aim this time to finally resolve the problem of these freedom-loving and disobedient minority peoples. Azerbaijan the Azerbaijani authorities, the Ministry of Defense, the police, the military registration and enlistment offices recruited the representatives of national minorities in large numbers, the Lesgins, the Talish and the Avars, and placed them on the front line. This way they wanted to achieve the following goals. Firstly, they're on the front line and they will incur losses. Thus, they were aiming at steering up their sentiments against the Armenians, stating that the ones responsible for your losses are the Armenians, while we are only defending ourselves. Secondly, they wanted to reduce the populations of their national minorities to prevent them from defending their rights. And thus, they are perpetrating a genocide against their minority peoples. In Artsakh, everybody knows that there is always a likelihood of resumption of military operations. Here, the state border, the line of contact and the battlefront have become one. And that is why the people of Artsakh are ready to repel the adversary's aggressive attacks at any moment. Here, they appreciate and attach importance to the activities of the international community and mediators on the conflict settlement, but rely on themselves and their defense army in the first place. There are few cases in the world where heroes are honored like this. In Artsakh, monuments, walls and obelisks to the fallen heroes are erected practically everywhere. Many institutions bear their names. And there is a tradition at schools and art centers. After classes, the students and teachers bake biscuits and send them to the defenders at the border.
Nagorno-Karabakh is returning to peaceful life. The authorities, benefactors from Armenia and the diaspora are helping in every possible way. Infrastructure is developing in the country, social programs are operating, and affordable housing is being provided. They built this neighborhood in Stepanakert only a few months ago. The state provided the apartments to the people for free. Despite the conditions of permanent tension at the border, Artsakh is not just standing firm, it is moving forward. Industry, business and tourism, education and healthcare are developing in the country. New enterprises are being set up, schools and hospitals are being built, new hotels and restaurants are opening, new resorts are coming up. Karabakh is like a beehive where the people are buzzing around like hardworking bees, constantly creating something new, building a better life little by little. Everything is being done for the people to live a full life with no feeling of isolation. Stepanakert State Choreographic College is the training ground of the Dance Ensemble of Karabakh and the Yerevan Academic Theatre of Opera and Ballet. Stepanakert State Choreographic College is the training ground of the Dance Ensemble of Karabakh and the Yerevan Academic Theatre of Opera and Ballet. Here they teach folk and modern dances, ballet, and train future choreographers. Motion is life and life is dance. I want to become a dancer so that everybody knows me. When you are sad, when you are happy, you live it and you show it in the dance. Every day involving dances is memorable. Any day I train and see this hall, I am simply very happy. I don't feel isolated at all. Wait until I get famous. I'll tell you how good it is over there. And I will be. That's my dream. These are the best kids in the world. These kids are the sons and grandsons of those who fought and some of them lost their lives in the 90s when the National Liberation Movement started. And also, the kids whose brothers and fathers are on the front line. They also manage to attend the classes without fail, sing, dance and demonstrate through their daily life that nothing can break us. The students and the graduates of Stepanakert State Choreographic College regularly participate in national and international concerts and festivals. They have won first place on two occasions in competitions in Russia and Georgia. Artsakh is trying to present its culture to the world and show them that it exists and that peaceful people live here, always creating something new, even when they are being forced to fight. We would like people to hear about Karabakh not as a conflict area, but as having creative people as one of the ancient regions in the world, because we even have traces of the ancient man, as well as ancient architectural monuments and a great number of heroes who fought in different wars, World War I and II. Small Artsakh gives many heroes, and the situation we have now attests to it all. However, we would like the world to remember about us, not only when talking about war. We want the world to know about Artsakh, which creates. Today, the people of Artsakh talk about their young generation with obvious pride. They say we are raising a courageous generation, real defenders of the motherland. We teach them to love their native country and be patriots. A good generation is coming up, carrying the genes of heroes, who like their fathers and grandfathers, 
firmly stand on their native land, and no one else but them will be the only owners of it. Living very close to the enemy for many years, the people of Artsakh have learned not only how to fight, but also to create. That is why these talented people, seeking to build and not to destroy, should primarily be known in the world through their creative achievements, art and science. The people of Artsakh are doing their best for their country to be, first of all, associated not with war, but with aspirations for peace and ancient history and a rich cultural heritage, as well as an incredible desire to carry on living and developing, despite all difficulties and troubles proving to the whole world that, on this front, they are invincible.